Good morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and you're listening to Light Talk. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas, and today we're going to talk about everything from your first concert to high school projects on Light Talk. And this is David in beautiful Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers! Lumen Brothers. Lumen Brothers. Lumen Brothers. <laughs> So, hey, guys, uh, what a week this was. And I know you guys are preparing to head off to uh, Erda's, right? That's right. So good luck, guys. As you know, I'm not attending because our our graduate program has been on hiatus for a while because we are pretty much ending it for the time being. But that's a whole other story. But you guys, good luck. One thing I do want to tell you guys about is you heard that, that situation with the building across the street, the John Hancock Tower. And you heard what happened with the elevator? Just that it fell. Yeah, there were people in it, and uh, it fell. I think it fell like 80 floors. But amazingly, there are some safeties on it, and it actually slowed the elevator down at the end. So there were no fatalities. I think there were some minor injuries. But I don't know if I'd go into that elevator if I were you guys. Oh, in the oh, this is you say in the Chicago Tower, the Hancock, across the street from. From the west, you guys aren't going to the west, then no, back to the Palmer House, the, the, the fully renovated Palmer House. Oh, that's cool. I didn't hear about the elevator issue, though. That's fascinating, yeah, because yes, we've been up and down that elevator many times. And yes, we have. <laughs> and uh, also, one other thing that came out this week was which was very interesting was the Theron Musser Yale essay. It was an essay that she wrote many, many years ago about the status of Broadway and lighting design. And uh, did you guys read it? Yes, I, I took a look at that. Yeah, what do you think, Steve? It was interesting. You know, it's uh, if, if it, the, there's a site called the Lighting Archives, right? And they have been working very hard over the years to make sure that bits of lighting history uh, don't disappear and to archive people's works. And this was a uh, four or five page essay that Theron wrote on that development of a lighting designer moving from the day when the set designer did his or her own lighting or passed that off to his or her assistant or even passed it off to the master electrician. So she's talking about the emergence of the lighting designer and, uh, and what's expected of them and having to uh, fight for every penny uh, <laughs> you make. So yeah. I, thought, I thought it was a very, I mean, I look at it today, it's what, 50, 60 years old? Right, right. Very kind of sweet look at the industry in those days. Um, and certainly she was a massive, massive force in uh, getting us to where we are today. Absolutely. And of course, Steve and I, our colleagues uh, from the past, the Bill and Jean Eckhart, were classmates of, of uh, Theron. So they all went to grad school together, which was always, <laughs> I heard a lot of very interesting stories. You know, Theron failed the uh, union exam several times. Yes, and I know this story. Go ahead and tell it, Steve. No, no, you tell the story. Well, it's it's kind of letting the cat out of the bag. But back then, when you took the union exam, you had to do all areas. You had to do costumes, you had to do scenic painting, you had to do uh, scenic, and you had to do lighting. And I had heard by a little birdie that flew by that she had some help. (laughs) <laughs> <in> that exam <laughs> when she and she did not fail it at that point. Oh, oh, oh! Let me let me add some revisionist history here. Okay. Uh, oh, you you had there was a, at one time there was a card called all categories. Yeah. And as David said, you had to uh, succeed in all categories. She had no trouble with the lighting, scenery, or costume portions of the exam. But they kept nailing her on her ability as a scenic artist. That's right. So Bill and Jean took her under their wing, and at their uh, brownstone in New York, they taught her how to paint. She took scenic artist 
paint class lessons from Bill Eckhart. That's right. And so he got her up to speed so she could pass the uh, scenic portion of, or scenic artist portion of the exam. And the rest is history, as they say. And the say. rest is history. And thank God they don't require us to do that anymore. <laughs> the entrance of the union is a lot more humane <laughs> than expecting you to know everything. Well, it also sort of had a, you know, I don't want to talk about my history, but you sort of had to have someone at court, so to speak, once upon a time. And maybe it's even somewhat true today. You sort of had to have an advocate. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, and the union meant something different back then. I mean, I used to have these long discussions with Bill and Jean about it. To personally, to me, it's an employment union. If you're a working, labor union. yeah, it's a labor union, exactly. But back then, it was sort of a stamp of approval. But there's a danger in that. There were some people who had union membership who should have not, who didn't really have my vote of approval. Exactly. <laughs> From an arts standpoint. And some people you know. were very, very um, tight with their own standards of what makes a good artist and what doesn't cre- make good artists. But that's yeah. a whole other story that we, one day we should talk about on Let's Talk About. So let's sure. go ahead and get started with the show. Steve, you have the first question. Yes, I have a question from... Uh somewhere deep in the heart of Texas, and it is from Junebug. Of course, she's from Texas, (laughs) with a name like Junebug. (laughs) Junebug says, any tips for my first time lighting a concert in a big space? So it sounds to me like Junebug has mastered uh, the bars, that he he has no trouble working in a bar. He has lit concerts forever. And now he's making that move. He's moving up to a slightly larger venue. (laughs) And if that's true, I would say um, rely on what you've learned. I mean, it's just just real estate. You know, instead of two lights to get across your stage, maybe now it takes eight lights to get across your stage. Um, But if if I were making a recommendation to someone who was really kind of a novice at this, I would say two things. Uh, keep in mind that the audience comes to see the concert. They don't come to hear the concert. They've saved their money all year long to see their favorite person on stage. So I would say uh, to make it a memorable evening for them, you really need to organize your console, and I would break every song into pages. I know that's a simplistic thing, but I've seen a lot of people who take their consoles and they have got... Everything known to man on it, it's eight pages deep. Uh, there's submenus everywhere. And that's great And when you're kind of sitting in your garage working on it. But man, when, you get, when, you get it, when you're doing it live, you need to be able to get to things quickly, and they need to be organized and easily accessible. So get your console in shape so that you can easily work on it and pull things up. And it should be second nature. The other thing I would say is don't exclude the audience. The audience is a big part of the of the concert experience, so keep them actively involved. You know, don't be afraid to light them. Don't be afraid to bring them in. Don't be afraid to show them something they're not expecting. So I would say just build on what you've already learned and go for it. You know, I, I totally agree with that, and I'm going to add one very important thing, and that is uh, uh, if you're going into a space that's much larger – then you really should hire somebody who's worked in that space as your assistant or associate. I was hired to do a big opera. I think it was Aida in the uh, Olympic Stadium in uh, Korea. And uh, I've never done a stadium show before. So I was putting together a team of people. Now, again, I guess we're assuming that you have a lot of money for this. Uh, you know, We don't know exactly how much you're getting paid to do this. But if you do have the funding... There's no shame in, bring, in putting together a team or at least one person, an associate, who has had experience. On my first New York show, I brought in Nick Solium to be my associate on that show because he had Broadway experience and I didn't. It was one of the smartest things I ever did in my life. So I highly recommend that. Uh, and then I have a very important question for Steve because, Steve, you're the Texan here. Is Junebug a male name or a female name? I I would go with uh, well I guess it depends I mean like Boo Boo could be uh, male or female okay. boo, boo is Boo is simply well Boo has two meanings it, it can either be dork 
or it can be beloved. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess June bug, uh, I guess depending how you use it in a sentence, it could be, uh, it could be male or female. All right, all right. I just, I just wanted, because you were referring to June bug as he and him and pronouns for, uh, you know, for a male. And I'm saying, I, did, I don't know, I, the only June bug I ever knew was an actual June bug. To be honest, I don't think uh, there's uh, any women out there dumb enough to uh, call themselves June bug. They'd change their names. <laughs> I think they would change their okay. name to something else. Okay. So Todd in Kansas writes, what is your greatest daily challenge that gets in the way of creating excellent lighting? Wow. There are so many challenges. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of it has to do with staff. A lot of it has to do with the way the theater is organized. You know, the production team is organized. The stage manager. If your stage manager isn't the apex of stage managers, that's going to be a big challenge. Money, obviously, time. I think time is the biggest challenge, to tell you the truth. Now that I'm listing off things off the top of my head, because you only have a limited amount of time, no matter where you're working. You know, even in Europe, the show is going to open eventually. So your time's going to run out. Everything is controlled by time. And you know who actually says this really well in his book is Steve Shelley. One thing I really love about Steve's book is like the first chapter is talking about limitations and understanding your limitations because everything has to fall in those limitations and time being really the most critical one, I think, time and money. But, you know, time costs money. So if you had more money, you could work 24 hours a day. But who wants to do that, right? So, yeah, I would say time. What do you guys think? So one thing that could get in the way is lack of preparation. So I always feel really good if I feel like I'm as prepared as possible. So that's really going to, if I'm not prepared or the designer's not prepared, that's really going to get in the way of, of the creativity part. Um, another thing that can short, slow you down is a piece of technology that's not working, <laughs> especially, if, especially yeah. if it's one that you need or one that you've really hung your hat on that's really important, whether it's a critical piece or even a small piece, but it's, but it's really going to um, have an impact on the creative uh, process. And the other one that's pretty pragmatic, I think David's getting out with time, is just poor scheduling. Um, it's really hard to be creative under a poor schedule, and I've turned down projects when the schedule, where I could just tell I'm not going to be able to get great lighting under those conditions in that schedule. Those would be my top three. Yeah, I'm turning down a project in about an hour uh, <laughs> because, because, because the goalposts. Right <laughs> yeah, the, I know the goalposts keep moving yeah, every day. The, the posts right. move a little distance, and it's at the point where you know there's no villains here, but it's time to say, look, you know, no, count me out. I, I can't. Uh, I can't do what you're wanting to do in the amount of time that you want it done in. I would also say the thing that gets in the way of uh, a really excellent design. Uh, is self-doubt. You, you start uh, questioning what you're doing. You start looking over your shoulder. You know, you're in that chair for a reason. Someone has hired you for a reason. And probably that reason is you're good at what you do. So the minute you start second-guessing yourself, start going, well, I know I was going to turn it blue, but I'll turn it red instead. You know, you start drifting away from what the ideas were that you and the director spoke about that gets you in trouble. And all of a sudden, you've got a perfectly adequate design. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing particularly spectacular. It's perfectly adequate. And you want to be more than perfectly adequate. You want to create excellent designs. Well, that was well, great. Well, you know, competency is undervalued. Everybody has to be an overachiever. I'm, I'm, sometimes like, I think we don't reward really strong competency. Hmm. We, we, everybody's got to be an overachiever in America. I just think it's an American phenomenon. It's like, you know what? You're good. You're not brilliant. It wasn't, a, but do we not, do we punish competency and only reward eh, extraordinary? I think I so. I don't know. I think so. I think being competent is a bad thing. I mean, you? just competent. Yeah, I, th I think, especially in I art. Think in, I think incompetent is a problem and we, don't separate, <laughs> and we don't separate competency from incompetency and we confuse right. Co excellence with competency. The, the next time you go in for, let's say, oral surgery, <laughs> and you look at your dentist, and you go, how are you? And the dentist goes, eh, I'm all right. I'm competent. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm competent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going to get up and leave the chair. I don't you know, want... man. <laughs> That's tomorrow morning. I'm having oral surgery tomorrow morning. And uh, I, made, I was telling Steve this earlier, that the last time I had it done... I decided to do it with local anesthetic instead of being put down. And uh, I didn't feel any pain. Put, put, but, I'm sorry, put put down? 
put down, <laughs> put down. Whenever I go unconscious, that's putting me down. Oh or, my goodness! Okay, and it was fine. It wasn't. It didn't hurt at all. But when she took the chisel and the mallet and was breaking my tooth. Right. And it was going, the vibration was going through my jawbone into my brain. I must tell, I, I was sweating and I'll never make that mistake again. So yes, but was the lighting excellent? The lighting was excellent. <laughs> but I told her, actually, she has some issues with color consistency in the, in the, in the cans overhead. And I kept on I thinking bet. about that. But no, seriously, um, it's like, that's competent. Okay. <laughs> you know, but okay, but let me, let me, let me clarify my point. So I'm on a, I'm on a, a, a crusade to reduce standing ovations because it used to be you would give a show a standing ovation because it was outstanding and you were, and you were, you you jumped to your feet to say thank you for the work and now everything i go to everything gets a standing ovation but that's cuz you live in Gainesville Okay, there's no, not a lot happening uh, no, there. No, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> and I'm not. And they've never seen that kind of great quality work before, so they're always standing up. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, and, I, and I'm not just a hick from Gainesville. Okay, so slow down there, buddy. But what I'm, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, it's it's another form of great inflation. So competency is not bad work. Okay. I want to be hired for my competency. No, and I think, and I think, and I, I just so, think, so you you go to the dean's office and say, "Hey, dean, I want a raise," and the dean goes, "Hey, you're competent." No, I think I think if you agree that we should live in a meritocracy only, right? Then forget about competency. Everybody is is above and beyond and meritorious, and no one is just doing a damn good job, or you or you totally stink. I don't know. I think it's an interesting conversation. Anyway, there's another question. <laughs> yeah, go Stan. <laughs> so um, Ellen in Delaware writes, uh, I'm planning on adding a tech design class next year to my high school. Could you recommend a good lighting project? Uh, I'll recommend two for uh, beginning designers that I've developed that I think work and I think the students like it. Although I'm not teaching high school, but you could certainly adapt these for high school. Um, one is a, what I call the fine art project, um, in which I, I give the students a menu of works of fine art. Um, if they want to come with another option that they want to present to me as an alternative, I, I'm open to that. And then they have to deconstruct that painting and, tr and try and recreate that painting in our light lab. It's not going to be 100% uh, but they'll use objects that sort of represent the objects or people that are in the work, and they do the best they can to simulate that. And then to push their imagination further, I ask them to, after studying the context of the work of art, to then reconceptualize that work in a different time, a different place, a different storyline, and then relight it to support that alternative concept. So that's one project. And the other one is sort of a, a straightforward one. The other one is a music project where they basically put um, objects and materials uh, into the light lab and they break down the song and they write cues and they create a light show around that song. Sometimes they even have live performers if we can get people to volunteer. So those are the two that I use and the students tend to enjoy them and I've refined them over the years and I still use them. Yeah, I, I use the same ones. They're very good projects. And uh, I'm going to add one more. And that is a project where you send students out to find the worst lighting they can find in an interior building. You know, take photographs, do research, and bring it in and explain to the class why it's the worst lighting they've ever seen in their life. Is this for high school? Yeah. Do you do this for high school students? No, I don't, I don't teach high school. I teach college students. But for oh, under, that's the question. Yeah, but he could do this for high school students. Okay. They, they eat at the same places that a lot of college students see at, you know? <laughs> I mean, I had a student do this, and she was a graduate student, and she went to a Krispy Kreme place and actually did the interior and exterior lighting. They had a takeout window in this Krispy Kreme, and they had this big wall, and you saw all, this, all these skid marks against the side wall. And that's because apparently the demographics of Krispy Kreme, no, Krispy Kreme after a certain time, like midnight, is uh, people are stoned in their cars. So they can't go ahead and maneuver around the walls. So they're crashing into the walls. So she said a big part of that was the, the, the lack of lighting and the poor lighting. So that didn't actually highlight the walls. So people weren't seeing the walls and they'd run into the walls. So she came up with this idea, which I think was absolutely brilliant, where she would embed LED 
strips into the side walls. It was decorative and it kept people from running into them. Nice. So you, that could be expanded to anything. It could be a Victoria's Secret. If somebody come and said, terrible lighting, you know, it's down lighting, blah, blah, blah. This is how I would improve it. So I find that project really useful in getting students to think outside the box and to realize all the lighting atmospheres that they see and live in every day. So that they're just not going into a store. They're starting to see the light, see the atmospheres. It's a good one. We use that. We use that project, David, at the, um, the you know, graduate architectural lighting seminar. Yeah. Ellen, I'm here for you. <laughs> okay. You're, you're, you're in the trenches. You're in the trenches. You don't care about fine art. Your students get, don't get stoned at uh, Krispy, Krispy Kreme. Kreme. <laughs> okay, okay, here's what you're going to do. You are going to take your students, and you're going to say, I want to do a project, and it's going to be a found space. And the found space is your school. It can't be the theater, and it can't be the gymnasium. Pick three scenes from your favorite Shakespearean play. Let's, let's pick uh, Hamlet. And let's pick the ghost scene. Let's pick uh, the gravedigger scene. Let's pick the get ye to a nunnery scene. Your students have to find a place in the high school that each of those scenes are going to be done. And they're going to light it. And they're going to light it with anything from a light bulb from Home Depot to an overhead projector to a light from the theater. But put them in a found space. You know, all of a sudden, what's going to happen is they're going to find a hallway with one light in it. They're going to find an elevator door that opens. They're going to find different ways to stage things and to think about things and different ways to uh, look at how theater can be created. So I would do a found space, limit the project, keep them out of the theater, keep them out of the gym, and turn them loose. If they want to go outside in the parking lot and do it under a street lamp, that's fine too. I think that's a great idea. I think these are great projects. You can fill up the whole semester with these projects. You are listening to Light Talk with Stan, Steve, and David, the Lumen Brothers. And Light Talk this week is sponsored by... Well, right about now, you've given up on your New Year's resolutions. You remember, you were going to walk 10,000 steps a day. No more complaining at the load-in while begging to drive the forklift. And to stop saying... When I was your age, to all the other stagehands on the call, all good goals and all out of your reach. Time to set some realistic resolutions. Number one, in 2019, I will not ask for a t-shirt until morning coffee. That's right, keep the road crew guessing. Pace yourself, wait until the LD has a relaxing Krispy Kreme donut in his hand before you say those five magic words, how about a t-shirt, man? (laughs) Resolution number two. In 2019, I will ask which end of the feeder goes in the box first. This also goes for multi, control cable, and miscellaneous rigging crap. Resolution number three. I will do my best while loading the truck not to say 360 that box. I will not flip the box that says do not flip, and I will not stack the box that says do not stack. This has been a public service announcement from no more 10 out of 12s. And now, back to light talk. Okay, that sound you hear in the background are the ducks running away from Stan. So Stan's in the Chinese his, restaurant. In the Chinese I'm restaurant. trying to eat you. And he's, he's got a knife and a fork r- literally running after these ducks. So I got a I'll, barbecue he's fork. He's got a barbecue fork. So anyway, that sound tells us that it's time for Let's Talk About. And uh, today we're actually going to do a part two of a Let's Talk About from about three or four weeks ago. And it's about negotiations. We started talking about negotiating contracts and we kind of, uh, you know, had some good points, but we ran out of time. And uh, some of our listeners wrote in and basically said, hey, can you talk about things like how do you negotiate with an agent? You know, should you have an agent? Things like that. We talked a little about USA minimums, you know, how much negotiation is involved when you're doing a USA contract. So do you guys have any uh, additional uh, ideas? Because I want to get into these uh, three areas real quickly. I'm going to let you go on those, but I'm just wanna, I just want to give one big one. 
uh, that's sort of an overall thing that happened to me yesterday. It wasn't a lighting project. It was something else that I deal with us on a board of directors. And we negotiated a fee. We negotiated a contract term. We sat down with the, all the principals. We all came to a very happy agreement. Some things we couldn't get. Some things we did. In any negotiation, there's compromise, right? So we all walked out feeling happy. And the person said, we'll send you the contract. You'll have it in the morning. We get the contract in the morning, and I open it up, and I go to the two sections. One was the fee, and one was the contract term. And both were the opposite of exactly what we had negotiated face-to-face. And I had in an email thread from earlier in the month. So I went back, copied the email back to the person and said, these two things are absolutely not what we agreed to yesterday face to face. So, and there's, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll get, I'll get that corrected and get it to you this afternoon, which the person did. But the big point is you got to read, guys. Yeah, read you your gotta, contracts. You got to really take the time and read your agreements. So, when they get big and complicated, people have lawyers read their agreements, but most of us don't do that. So you, it's just like terms of service. I mean, you, unfortunately, as boring as it seems, when you, you don't get what you want or something gets screwed up, and they, and they go, well, read your contract. Did you sign that? Oh, I didn't catch. You got to read. Yep. That's my big one. Yep. And if it's in a foreign language, you don't understand that language, pay somebody to go ahead and uh, translate it for you. It's worth it. That's what I used to do. But one thing I wanted to point out is that unlike a lot of different areas of the theater, as a designer, understand that in most cases, the reason why that production director or that general uh, director or, or artistic director is calling you to light that show is because the director recommended you, wants to work with you. So you are already at a, a very powerful uh, level because that director has told that artistic director that, that's, that you're the person that they want to light the show. So that's one thing you should always keep in mind. You're not fighting other people for the job. Now, if you're totally uh, ridiculous <laughs> and you like uh, start demanding things that they can't afford, then the artistic director or production manager will go back to the director and say, you know, Dave's being a jerk. He wants $12,000 for the show, but we can only afford to pay him seventy five, dollars and he's not really helping us. So uh, you don't want that to happen because it's going to make the director look bad. Uh, so there's always a middle ground there. There really is. If anyone's doing a show in Europe, I highly recommend that you get an agent. Absolutely. And get a good agent. And the agent will try to get as much po- money as possible because the higher fee, the more money the agent makes. So that's a really good thing. It's worth the 10%. Another thing we talked about were that if you're doing a USA show or, or a, you're working with a theater that has a USA collective bargaining agreement, understand that the rates that are presented in the rate book, those are minimums. Okay? Those are minimums. So if it says something like a lighting designer for a musical on Broadway is going to earn at least $20,000, well, I can guarantee you that Don Holder makes more than a minimum, all right? So don't just look at those minimums. Ask for more. And then you're going to ask, well, how much more should I ask for? Go ahead, find out a designers or a group of designers who have worked in that theater before and email them and ask them. What range do you think I should ask for? What range do you think the theater can afford? And that designer will give you a range. I know I've done it. I've get, I get emails like that a lot. So go ahead. Don't be afraid to ask. I can say everything David just said in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. Don't leave any money on the table. It's hard to know how much money is on the table when you're young. But as you, as you grow and you get, become more professional, you have a sense of what things are worth. And I don't discount any of the things that David said. And, and certainly you did get the job because you're competent and maybe because you're, and <laughs> no, maybe because you're, you're brilliant. Extra- I don't, extraordinary. Maybe, you're, maybe you're extraordinary. <laughs> you're one in a thousand. I don't know. Okay, but I, but I would say, I'll think of an example. So I was negotiating a fee recently. And this was for a public project. And this is the first time this ever happened in my career, where the architect was putting together the, all the fees for the client, and we were getting copies of, the, of his presentation because it's public dollars. And I was surprised 
that I was getting to see what everybody else on the team was getting, right? Which was sort of like, wow, interesting. And I'm the, I'm the theater consultant and a, a colleague of mine, somebody I work with quite a lot is the architectural acoustics consultant. And our fees were within $1,000 of each other because we're sort of similar in what we do. And I was shocked that we were that, we did not communicate, we did not collude, okay? It just was that we were so close and it made me feel good that we're so, this person has much more experience and, and uh, thousands of projects under their belt compared to me in, the, in that field. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm right on target. So, you know, but it is sometimes hard to know how much money is on the table. And that's just gonna come with time. But the more information you have, the stronger position you have. And yes, I may have gotten the job because I was competent or that I was extraordinary, but I really got the job because the director asked for me. Sure. And you could be incompetent. And if the director wants you to do that show, they will hire you to do that show. They may regret it, but they hire you to do the show. <laughs> well, maybe you, maybe they, you know, you did, you bribed them. I don't know. I don't Who know. Knows? I've seen it. I've seen it happen. People are working. Sure. There are a lot Sometimes of incompetent people Sometimes it's because, you know, working. there's all kinds of reasons why people want to work with people. Yeah, that's right. Zhang Wei in China wants to know, what would you say are the principles of good design? There's a lot of principles of design, and I'm going to, I'm going to be fairly succinct and, and focus in on five that I think are important. I think when you're looking at lighting design, um, something you want to achieve, something that's important is contrast. I think contrast is an important principle of design because it allows you to draw out the important elements of a design. It allows you to draw out actors, uh, primary actors from secondary and tertiary actors. So I think contrast in your lighting is important. I think balance is really important. I think balance, uh, and when I say balance, what I mean is symmetry versus asymmetry. And I think those two elements, symmetry and asymmetry, are at the heart of every design. Um, Third, repetition. I think repetition is a really important part of design. And that can be repetition in structure of cues. It can be repetition in something is uh, circular. You start a cue that's very dark, you build five or six cues inside the scene that make it brighter, and you collapse back down to that dark scene that uh, as you began the uh, moment. And the audience sees the connection there. Color, really important. I think it's a significant part of the design. I think you need to really spend some time thinking about color when you start a new design. Uh, color is going to be at the heart, I think, of setting mood on stage. And finally, movement. I think movement guides your eye. And I think your eye is guided by timing. It could be guided through actual movement of uh, fixtures on stage. It could be shifts of intensity or direction. So for me, those are five things I really think about when I put a design together. Yeah, that, that's excellent because I, I agree with you, Steve. Contrast, you know, if you think about it, Contrast is in all of the uh, all of the qualities of design. Contrast of color, contrast of movement, uh, contrast of shape. Uh, contrast really is everything, and also contrast and visibility. I would add conventions that that we that we create conventions in lighting, conventions that actually tie in with the story. That whether it be color or movement or whatever, that whatever we want to send a message to the audience. We return them to a previous look, so we set up a convention. And sometimes you break conventions, and it's okay, but better be a good reason to do it. I also agree with Steve about movement. Movement, I've said this before, is really, really, really powerful quality of light. I think it's the most powerful quality of light. Transitions, be able to create transitions between conventions, or maybe the convention itself is a transition, or a transition is a convention. Very, very important to understand transitions. And bottom line, like I said last week, tell the story. That is the most important thing. That's the most important principle. Am I turn now? Well, there are only three of us, and uh, Steve okay. went first. I went so second, and I guess unless the ducks want something to say, no, you're no, on. no. I got. I do have something to say. Okay. First, my middle name is Contrast. I love <laughs> you guys. I love Contrast. Contrast is everything. It's true, but. 
let me add, because I do have a little sprinkle here to put in. As Steve was going through his items, I, was, I had my list, and I was checking off all the ones that Steve said, and I was curious to see if I'd have any left. And I do. I have a few left. And, and so I, the question didn't talk about principles of lighting design. So when I started to research this, they just said principles of good design. So there are sort of some things that may or may not fall into lighting. But here's some that did not get my check marks. Shape right, is one to think about. Value, which is sort of gets the contrast and intensity and all that, but value, form, texture, and space. I think that's talking in very sort of broad terms, that, that grouping, and within that grouping, color is there. And then there's this other grouping, Steve hit three of them, balance, contrast, and movement, but in this grouping, there, and as Steve did, I think you hit it just in lighting terms, emphasis, right, uh, is, is another thing. Pattern, which is Steve's point about repetition. Pattern is a form of repetition. Rhythm, which is a form of repetition. And unity and variety also. And then for the more sophisticates in the audience, because David was hitting on this, and I'm just going to put some other words to it. So when you design lighting or anything in the stage, for the stage, or what, that is essentially fantasy, where you're asking the audience to willingly suspend their disbelief and enter another world, they sort of wipe they sort of unconsciously or consciously wipe the slate clean and allow themselves to enter that world. And then you, the design team, create what David's getting at, which is a vocabulary that the audience will then attach meaning to. So there's a great book by a guy named Pavis who writes, this, who writes about this thing called diachronics, which is sign systems. So in a performance, you can, as a designer, ask the audience to assign meaning to certain objects, which then creates a vocabulary within that world that you've created. And most audience members will go there with you. And that's really powerful. It's sort of like science fiction or um, there's just different ways. I'll give you an example. When I saw, um, I think it was Les Mis on Broadway. I think that was lit. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Andrew Bridge who did the lighting. Uh, David Hershey. David Hersey? What's it, David Hersey? I thought okay. it was David I Hersey. I it? thought it was Andrew Bridge, but I can't remember. Okay, but here's an example of what I mean by that, a, simp a simplified example. So in that production, you know, the peasants, everything is sort of earth tones and, and, and dark and poor and so on. And when any of the peasants, and sometimes there's follow spots on these characters when they are singing, and the follow spot is warm and dim, but yet it does give them emphasis from the crowd. But when they died what happens was the follow spot would lose its color and it would become a brilliant white and glow super bright and then go out. So we, normally we associate death with the loss of light, with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a, you know, sort of a draining of the energy. And this actually, he did the opposite. At the point of death, because their lives were so miserable, they were sort of exalted. The light got brighter like a brilliant sun. And then it went out. And then the first time that happens to me in my experience was like, wow, that's what's going on there. That's different. Not what I would expect. But then I, I understood that there was meaning to that action. And he created a vocabulary that was, as Steve said, repeated throughout the production. And it helped, it helped tell the story, as David said. That's my addition. Okay, here's the answer. Original Broadway production, David Hersey. Oh, I, okay. I, I can't believe I pulled that out. <laughs> I really, that's that's a lot better than what I normally do. <laughs> hey, that Hammond organ solo in the background tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk fun. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. But if you choose to litigate, our very solid state law firm of Cobb, Driver, and Array will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to tune in next week when we discuss Pardell or Altman Fresnel's My Film Lighting Sucks... <laughs> <laughs> Help with a first budget and misconceptions about lighting designers. Oh my God, that can go on forever. <laughs> All of that. And someone's going to come up with a new sponsor. 
Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. So long, everyone.